Up here in front of us, we have a uh, acquaintance of mine. Uh, we've met online before. Uh, he's giving a talk entitled SOA at Casper. Uh, he's from, you're, you're from, where are you live, Brooklyn? Uh, I'm from Cleveland. You're from Cleveland? <laughs> I thought, but Casper. I live said, in New York. Okay, yeah. but, you're, but you're from Cleveland. Where do I'm you live now? Uh, in Manhattan. All right. Yeah. Well, fancy. <laughs> uh, his talk's entitled SOA at Casper. Uh, please welcome uh, JP Silvashi. That, that's good. Actually, that's good. right. Yeah. Exactly. It's close. Very good. <laughs> All right. Thanks, JP. Great. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Good. Great. Uh, so this isn't actually the title of my talk on the, um, on the agenda, you might notice. But uh, similar idea, and it's something like a retrospective of moving off of Wombat. Um, and I'll get into what Wombat is if you've not heard of it. I'm assuming a lot of you have heard of Wombat. Um, I wanted to say thanks to Clark and Stemble for putting this on. It's fantastic. Uh, Amanda, the website looks amazing. Um, all the printed work looks great. Um, so I think it's kind of funny to think of the years you wrote certain languages professionally. I think it's an interesting way to profile a developer. We can share all the pains that we've went through. Uh, I wrote Java for a few years professionally, uh, then to PHP, uh, and then Ruby. And now I write some Node. That might be surprising to some of you guys. Um, I've worked with companies like Charles Schwab, Engine Yard, Rackspace, uh, and 500 startups. Um, and probably because of that, I've worked with a variety of failed startups. Um, three or four, maybe five of them. <laughs> uh, and right now, I'm the director of platform engineering at Casper. <clears throat> so can I get a show of hands really quick? Is, is, who's heard of Casper here? Wow, that's amazing. That's very good. Uh, <laughs> so I probably can keep the part of describing what we do a little shorter. But we, we make products that make your days better by giving you a better night's sleep. Um, and that sounds like a big lofty thing, but uh, we make be beds, mattresses, um, and sheets and pillows just more recently. Um, and we've got a bunch of new exciting products coming out. Uh, you can just imagine all the cool things related to sleep. <laughs> um, we're one of the fastest growing e-commerce com e companies in the world right now. Uh, our headquarters is in New York. We started just two years ago, and we've got nearly 200 employees already. Um, we're cu we currently only ship to the United States and Canada, but we are moving worldwide in, in just the next few months, uh, which is a tremendous task. And I'm sure some of you have been through those pa excuse me, pains. Uh, and right now, we're hiring about two to three people per week. And we're moving into our fourth office. And it's going to be really cool. And if anyone's looking for a job, we're hiring. <laughs> So come talk to me if you want a job at Casper. I'm going to show you some of our product pages. They're beautiful. Uh, this is our mattress. This is the mattress. We only sell one kind of mattress um, in a variety of sizes, obviously. I was really excited to see that our geo location or our geo IP setup worked and gave me the Canadian price for that. That's the mattress. We have a full set of sheets. You can buy them individually, which I think is bizarre. <laughs> but people do. People will buy one pillowcase, which is fascinating. <laughs> we get many of these orders a day where people are looking for one pillowcase. It's so silly to me. Uh, we have a revolutionary pillow, if there can be such a thing. I think we've, we've made it. It's a pillow inside another pillow. Uh, <laughs> uh, you have to innovate in this way if you want to sell a pillow in 2016. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and you can unzip it and take the one pillow out of the other pillow, uh, believe it or not. I can. <laughs> it's machine washable, too. Um, I thought this was funny. We, we used to call this the CA king on here, and we would get dozens of phone calls a week, people asking if that's the Canadian king <laughs> size mattress. <laughs> so we had to change it to California king. And actually, the California king is smaller than a king size mattress. That's another interesting thing. Um, so let me tell you about our engineering team first. Uh, we've got 24 team members, mostly front end and design. 
if you can imagine, our brand is very um, design and kind of brand driven. We've we, we changed the design of our website um, several times in the last year, which I think is an e-commerce type of thing to do. Um, and everything's very customer experience focused. When we set out to build a new feature, the first question is sort of, uh, how is this going to affect the buying process? What's unique about this uh, when shopping online? Can they experience this at one of our like 14 different copycat companies? Uh, if, if you, you've probably seen companies that look a lot like Casper out there. There seems to be one launching like every week right now in the bed in a box uh, category, as they say. Um, <laughs> we've won a lot of design awards too, so we're really proud of our front end. And um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that we've been able to focus on that because of adopting tools like Spree. Uh, we don't have to build all the internals, and it's allowed us to get up and running really fast. So I'm sure that's uh, the case for a lot of a lot of you here. Um, as we've grown, we, we've had a challenge in having a big engineering team work on one code base. Um, and at the rate of development we were working, it was really hard to keep our tests passing, wait for a half hour <laughs> for our test suite to run, um, and then deploy. So right now we actually maintain about five major applications. There's a bunch of other smaller ones that do more menial back-end work. But um, we have our storefront. We call it Storefront. That's Solidus. We actually upgraded from Spree. We are one of the companies that successfully went through the upgrading process. Thanks, Stembolt. <laughs> uh, we have an app called Bedpost, which is a pun, obviously, uh, and that deals with logistics and shipping. You can get one, you can get delivery in LA, San Francisco, and New York within one hour of ordering, and you can receive a mattress uh, in, in an hour, uh, which was really hard to build. <laughs> uh, we have a reservations app for all our showrooms and our pop-up events that we do where you can put your name on a list and get a time for a nap. <laughs> uh, and we have a messaging API. This handles all of our customer communication, SMS, uh, postcards. We send printed postcards. Um, and then we have a tool called Sleepforce, which is a Salesforce uh, syncing service, sort of. Does anybody here work with Salesforce or has worked with Salesforce? Oh, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I guess you know, the, the, the big question for us was, why break a perfectly fine monolithic application into separate services? This is a really hard question to answer. And oftentimes, I don't know if we've made the right choice myself. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question that gets posed probably to every growing engineering team. Is it, are we ready for nano services? Um, stuff like that. And you don't write Node, so probably the answer is no. Um, so it's kind of a debate about what, the, what, what a reasonable SOA architecture looks like. Um, kind of what is the responsibility and scope of each application? And should we even do it? Does it make sense to, to split it? Oftentimes, it makes sense to keep a monolithic application. It's more portable. Um, you can maintain all the knowledge about the application in one spot. Uh, it's easier to test. You don't need to test um, inter-service communication and stuff like that. Um, so Rails promotes a monolithic design. Spree promotes this design. And it, you get a lot of mileage out of it. So uh, you know, it's oftentimes the way you end out with your application. And it's gigantic. Uh, but there's good things about it, too. Uh, just like microservices, there's some terrible things that microservices give you. But uh, we, we've kind of been moving that direction out of necessity. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the negatives of that in a minute. Um, so the idea is kind of land us right in the middle. What's the right size service for your problems in your team? Is there, is there a reasonable size app that your team likes to work on? It's not, um, it doesn't have the problems of a monolithic app, but it's also not too challenging to work with because it doesn't do anything. It only does one thing. It only takes payments, let's say. Um, but the microservice route is getting embraced you know, much more often now. Uh, for example, Uber has more than 700 services. That sounds ridiculous, but it's true. Um, 
So, and the Rails community has been somewhat resistant to the idea of having microservices. Just recently with Rails 5, uh, you can generate an API application with just a REST API. They've merged in the Rails API gem uh, into the core. So I think microservices are going to grow in popularity with Rails. If you do consulting work, uh, you're probably more prone to doing a monolithic app. Uh, it's easier to onboard new developers. It's easier to hand off to the company if you're not going to maintain it forever. Uh, they won't hate you for it. Uh, it's sort of a safer route to go. So uh, oftentimes, that's, that's sort of the architecture that you end out with. Um, <laughs> Let me tell you something about the enterprise service bus. Has anybody heard about, about this? Is this, a, is this a phrase? Oh, only two people have heard this. <laughs> uh, it's a terrible name. It's, you, you know you don't want to get involved with it. It says enterprise in it. Uh, <laughs> so our dear friends at Spree made something called Wombat. Um, and since I like show, showing of hands for polling things, who, who's heard of Wombat here? Wow, everybody's heard of Wombat. Who's used Wombat? Keep your hand up if you used Wombat. Keep your hand, hand up if you still use Wombat. Good, that's impossible because it it's not online anymore. Uh, if you still use it, you might want to check your logs. <laughs> um, it was really great. We actually really liked the idea of Wombat. It allowed us to, it allowed us to keep all our data in one place. We didn't have to think about uh, the REST interface between services. Um, it allowed us to retry when certain uh, integrations <laughs> fail. It, it was nice. It gave you a log. It had some really nice features. It had a lot of enterprise-like features that resemble an enterprise service bus, uh, which we didn't know what that was before we used Wombat. And we didn't realize we were using something that um, was trying to solve that problem. Um, you save yourself from writing API adapters. That's probably the biggest plus, is that when you start your business, you don't want to have to write an integration to Twilio, integration to Mandrel. I mean, you could use ActiveMailer, but, um, and the dozens of other third-party integrations that your marketing team will convince you uh, increases conversions. So we didn't want to deal with that problem. We wanted to build um, the things that made the business differentiate itself, and it wasn't API adapters. Um, it integrates with Spree. Obviously, it integrates with Spree. Uh, uh, let's see. Wombat also keeps its own copy of a, a database. It keeps it all in one place. It's some sort of NoSQL or Mongo database. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Dynamo. Um, I actually like Dynamo, so it's... I was going to make fun of it, but uh, I do like Dynamo. Um, but your application still needs a database. This doesn't take that away. It's not the truth store for any, any of your objects. In fact, it, it leads you into some dangerous places if you fully embrace Wombat like we did. Um, so before Wombat, you end up making all of your own integrations. You talk directly from your Rails application to each of these things. Um, you might, like I said, use Mandrel, uh, Twilio. We use a service called AfterShip that would do periodic polling of UPS and a variety of other delivery partners to see the state of the delivery and also Salesforce, uh, which is a major part of our business and a major pain point of our business, I should say. Um, so there's dozens of interactions that you can put into, into Wombat, and they had a big catalog of integrations, and we made some of our own integrations. We uh, influenced them, let's say, to build some integrations, um, but it just didn't kind of have the, the gas to make it through for us. It was, it was rough, but I'll get there in a minute. <laughs> so when you get Wombat, you're really excited when, when you install Wombat. It seems like this is going to solve all your problems. How nice. This is great. So you, you, you put it in, you start tearing out all of the work you did uh, to integrate all these other services, and you start plugging them into Wombat, then you find out, oh, 
we have to trans translate every re request using JavaScript. It's a nightmare. But you do it, and you're done, and it's, you don't have to go back to it. Um, and everything seems fine. So when you sign up, you get the gem. You set up the objects you want to push into it. At the time, it was called Hub, I think. And they changed it. Um, then you set up your events, which are basically observers that watch a particular attribute. And then if it changes, it'll trigger an event or flow. In, in Wombat. Um, and then you go wild and add hundreds of integrations. Let me see. So these transforms, really quick before I go any further, they would do things like you would select the right attribute that would be maybe the phone number of the user to send into the Twilio uh, API. They're meant to be really thin transformations, nothing like ETL. Uh, which is ex uh, extend, what does ETL stand? Extract, Extract, transform, and load. Uh, there's bigger tools for that that you would use now. But you can go down this, this terrifying path of using Wombat to do that. And we did that a little bit, too. Uh, we did basically everything under the sun that is terrifying about Wombat and then had to back out of it a year later. Um, so there were some cons that we noticed like right out of the gates using Wombat. And one was it was really slow to sync. It, it uh, was supposed to sync the objects within a minute. Sometimes it would take up to 10. Uh, so that was really challenging to deal with. We didn't know. It could have been something that might not have been that bad if we had known about. Um, the UI was really error prone. It, they didn't hide the fact that it was running on Heroku by any means. So if anybody here has used Wombat, you've probably seen the purple Heroku application offline error <laughs> also. Uh, so it was really cumbersome to use. Had a lot of bugs, but overall, we really liked it. And we wanted it to stay around. Uh, and we wanted to see it improve. We were willing to help uh, improve the integration. So it was, it was rough when it, when it went away. But <clears throat> so here's where we went dangerously astray. Uh, when we realized we had a lot of unique shipping challenges, like we do courier delivery, um, we have this uh, our mattress comes in a box, so it's a huge box. Uh, so it's, we have a lot of different shipping partners all over the place. They all have their own interfaces. We need to do a lot of hacking to get uh, Spree to work. We ended up not using the shipping functionality in Spree and moving it to its own app, the one I talked about earlier, Bedpost. Um, the thing we did wrong here was we made Bedpost as though it was a plug-in to Wombat. Uh, it's, you know, we were sort of led that way by Wombat. Look, it'll just sync the data. That's great. We'll just plug it in, just like any of the other integrations. Um, and that was a terrible choice. And we didn't know how bad of a choice it was at first. But essentially what happened was we have a shipment object that then shared sort of Frankenstein attributes with Solidus and Bedpost, where some of the attributes would be owned by Solidus, and some were owned by Bedpost. Uh, but it wasn't clear which ones. It wasn't obvious to the developer which, which attribute can I change right now. We tried to keep them the same, but once you add an attribute to, like you write a migration, you add something to an object in Solidus, and then all of a sudden you see it in Wombat, and you say, oh, we can have that in Bedpost. You just add it to that one, too. And then that's a, that's a dangerous route to go. So I talked a little bit about each of these points here, but the pros that we saw about Wombat sort of morphed into cons. We were excited about the fact that we didn't need to worry about um, syncing these things across our applications. But then we fell into this trap of there not being a source of truth for the attributes. They were here if it was a text message phone number, but over here if it's their email. And that was, that was a really hard thing to back out of as well. And I'll show you some things about that. Um, since it was the center of all of our infrastructure, uh, and it was kind of down often, and there was no SLA, it was a lot of trust to put in this service uh, that, that we didn't know if it was going to be around for a very long time. And we were proven correct. So be weary of 
the SLAs on hosted services. Um, and like I said, transforms are not the same as ETL. So companies traditionally use tools like Apache Spark, which we use now uh, for, for certain things, or Flink is new based on Apache Spark, I think. Um, Wampa was really hard to also query and audit. You couldn't really write a query and just get stuff out of Wombat. You had to sort of work with their interface. It was really, it was really challenging. Um, and you should definitely not make your own service that depends on it to sync. Uh, if, if there's another service that pops up like Wombat, uh, be wary of that. So this is what I was talking about earlier. So we had two different shipment objects. They had some attributes that were the same, some that weren't. Uh, and we didn't have a global schema where we understood what a shipment was everywhere in the business. There wasn't the idea of a shipment object that I could talk to someone on the logistics team about and also someone on the storefront team. And we would be talking about the same object. We were kind of talking about these two different objects that merged together and, and, and had a deep relationship with each other. but. Uh, we're, we're loosely coupled in a lot of ways, too. <clears throat> so I think a lot of these problems were realized by the community, and they canceled Wombat. So it lived for a really short amount of time. It was about a year and a half, almost two years. We used it for a year. We had more than 30 flows and 12 services integrated with it. Um, and then the service ended in March of this year. And so, and it was announced in October that it was going to be going offline. So we had to scramble to get it in order. It's a very short lived application, which is sad. So we had to quickly find a solution. I know Bonobos had dealt with this too. And uh, I think also a few other businesses that, that relied on it. Um, who here has heard of AMQP? Who uses AMQP? Oh no, only two. Uh, it's amazing. And it offers a lot of the functionality of Wombat kind of baked into it. It has queues, you can have subscribers, a pub sub uh, interface, uh, it's persistent, it's great. Um, so it's persistent. If a message isn't consumed, you know, right, it gets written to disk. It has at least once delivery uh, guarantees, which is a nuance that everyone should be aware of before they start using it. Oh, by the way, we use RabbitMQ. I didn't mention that. RabbitMQ is an implementation of the AMQP protocol. So it has at least, at least once delivery, which means you need to write item potent consumers that read it out of, out of the queues. Otherwise, sometimes an action will happen twice. You might send an email twice to somebody if you're not weary of this. So uh, that's, that's a gotcha to look out for. It has ACTS and NACS, those are just acknowledgments and negative acknowledgments. So if your consumer fails to handle a message, you can send it back up to the queue. Um, it has this concept of dead letter exchange. And I think the idea of a dead letter queue isn't uh, exclusive to AMQP, but it's sort of the failed jobs queue in Wombat. Um, so you can go there and retry them. And in AMQP, you use something called a shovel to do that. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more about what shovels are and how to use them in a bit. So there's like five, there's like four and a half key components to AMQP. One of them sort of uh, a amalgamation of other ones, and that's consumers. But the main parts are exchanges, messages, queues, consumers, and bindings. Um, and there's a little analogy to this. So if we were to, if we going to use a brick and mortar store, let's say, as an analogy, and I'm going to use an, an Apple store in this case, an exchange is like the actual brick and mortar store itself. Uh, the message is the customer coming in through the front door with their, with their problem. If they need to go to the Genius Bar, their return, uh, or maybe they want to buy something. So that's the message and their payload. Uh, the queue is the lines. If you want to check out, you have to get in one line. If you want to go to the Genius Bar, you have to sit and forever, and they take you. Uh, and the consumer, in this case, is 
the person that works at the Apple Store is dealing with each of the customers. Uh, and then the binding is the kind of directive to the employee at the store of, where do I send people when they come in here or something? <clears throat> Here's a silly drawing from their website uh, that describes that. It's sort of misleading in that they don't show how bindings work, and bindings, I feel like, is a core component of AMQP that makes it really powerful. Um, so here's an example, and I'll describe why bindings are really powerful things. So we emit events for a variety of, of different objects in, in Solidus. For example, any transition that happens in any of the state machine implementations, a event is emitted, and we have a structure to these events. And these events are the object name, pluralized, and then the action that occurred. Um, and we use bindings to route those messages into particular queues. So, and queues can have many, many bindings. Uh, and routing keys can, uh, or I should say, the bindings can use pattern matching. So you can just say shipment dot splat, and then every shipment will go into that queue. So if you want to build a logging system that just logs shipment information, you can subscribe to just that queue. <clears throat> And the routing key, I shall say, is goes along with the message when it's published. It says, I'm a message about shipments shipped, and any, any uh, queue that's concerned with this um, can get a copy of my message uh, put, in the, put in the queue. So here's sort of a pseudo schematic of, of a message entering uh, the exchange at the top, we, we use a fan-out style exchange. So the message comes in and it gets emitted into any of the queues that have bindings that are listening to it. So if a shipment shipped event comes in, it's being listened to by the storefront. The bet, so the app that sends that out is Bedpost, like I said. Um, so these three services will each get a copy of that and they'll all deal with it uniquely in their own queue. So Solidus will need to mark the messages, or the shipment is shipped. Our messaging service will SMS the user or email them, uh, and Sleepforce will do its Salesforce thing. Um, and this goes on much further. This now is a bunch of other services, but these are kind of the main ones. <clears throat> so I have just a really Simple example, just kind of some screenshots of the app in action. We're, we're currently on Heroku. We're in the process of moving off of Heroku. Uh, it's very expensive and awful. And uh, it's not awful. It has a lot of the nuances of something like Wombat. Let's just use that as an analogy here. Uh, it's easy to get going on, but you're quickly kind of stuck with certain, certain things. But we love Rabbit, and this be, for this reason, Probably, probably the biggest reason, I should say, is that you can just let the queues drain at whatever pace matters to you. So it doesn't necessarily matter when we send the person an email that their shipment is shipped, as long as it's within 20 minutes of when it actually does, I guess. Um, so here's an example of a big shipment from one of our pro providers where you know, it said there was 50 messages per second that came in, and then we had 1,500 messages in the queue, and we could just let it chug through it and work at delivering them. It was doing one, one and a half per second, 1.2 per second it was dealing with them. So we found this to be a good way of, of scaling our infrastructure in a cost-effective way. If you have really intermittent peaks of traffic or events from third-party vendors, like this again is, is probably shipping events where we'll get hundreds or, or thousands of events in the order of a few minutes. Um, if you wanted to deal with all of that uh, at the time of the message, you would need to be running a lot of servers. So you can defer these type of things and take your time to work through these queues uh, if, if, if that's of interest to you. <clears throat> that's a useless photo of the queues. Um, so I'm going to just talk really quickly about some of the small services we've built to replace the Wombat uh, inter integrations. 
Um, these are just a few that I've picked out that I think are interesting that show off some of the, the design patterns you could use in your own apps if you guys have these problems. Um, so the, the big one, I've talked about this a few times, is the messaging API. So if we're anything like any of your businesses, you send lots of emails to your customers to let them know things have happened. If, it's, uh, if you have a recurring business, let's say you, re you bill people every month and their payment fails, you might want to send them a message. If their shipment is shipped, you'll send them a message. Uh, we do promotional things through here. We also deliver postcards, like actual physical postcards, transactionally. So when customers do a certain event, they'll get a customized postcard um, for them. So we also send SMS messages through here and stuff like that. So the messaging API service. So the question is, why didn't we just use Action Mailer in each of these apps? Uh, and the problem was, when you move into a service-oriented world, you then have to replicate a lot of things like this. And this is like one of the hard parts about building a service-oriented uh, architecture, is that naturally you'd want to build this with Action Controller, or uh, sorry, Action Mailer, and just put that in each of the apps. Then you have a template problem where one of the designers wants to change the template, and then they need to do it in seven apps. It's just not going to work. So we built the, this messaging API. Uh, and it handles emails, SMS, uh, like I said, message, uh, postcards from this company, Lob. They have an amazing API, by the way. If you want to send out any paper mailers, I suggest they're, they're great. Check it out. We also send messages when a shipment has a missed delivery. So UPS will tell us, hey, we tried to deliver the package, but it wasn't, no one was home. And we send the message to the customer that they missed a delivery. Um, let's see. You can schedule messages. Uh, that's something that's kind of challenging to do with action mailer unless you, you build it into your app. Uh, you can cancel scheduled messages. So an example of this is abandoned cart. Uh, when somebody places something in their cart and they don't check out, in eight hours they'll get an email that says, hey, you put this in your cart. Don't you want to buy it? Um, so we'll queue that up right when they put something in their cart. And then if they check out, we'll cancel it. <clears throat> or if they add something to their cart, we'll cancel it and update it. Uh, it's on Rails 5, so I'm not, I'm not reading these in order, am I? Um, so we, we use UUID uh, keys, which I'm now regretful of. Uh, we built it on Rails 5. Rails 5 is really cool because it's, it allows you to generate an application using the Rails API gem or what was previously part of the Rails API gem. So you can generate an app without any views. Uh, and it also is Dockerized. We keep the SMS templates in the app, uh, in the database. They are mustache templates. This is just a few of them. And they're uh, routing keys that triggers them to, to be sent. Uh, I'm going to move a little bit quickly because I only have a few more minutes left. Uh, email Builder is more or less a build process. It's not really a service. We use this to, we, we provide this as a tool for our front end designers to quickly make emails and lob templates and upload them to whatever email service we're using for that particular template. So Mandrel, for example, it'll upload the template up there. It'll send it to Litmus to test. It'll do all these things that would be a really big pain to do with Action Mailer. Uh, we built a CLI for dealing with our, our AMQP setup. Uh, so we wanted to use this just to replace the Wombat web UI. We didn't need a web interface to see the status of all these queues, excuse me, queues. So we just built a little CLI with Thor. Uh, and it allows us to bootstrap the entire environment also. So there's a little GIF of it here. I didn't have time to get this working locally. Uh, so it just shows some things that it does. It lists them out. It's pretty straightforward. So Sleep Force. This is the last one, somewhat hilarious. Uh, it maintains the syncing of the state of orders and uh, 
cases and everything in Salesforce. So our support team, which is now about 60 people doing support, can quickly find customer information when someone calls. Uh, Salesforce can be a really great tool. It really can. But uh, it's a pain to, to sync with another service. Um, and I won't go into all the details with this. So a few last notes. RabbitMQ's configuration is portable. Um, it's a JSON file. You can even put it in version control so people can change the configuration and you can talk about it on GitHub. Uh, you can pull it and, and configure your application with, your, with the Exchange CLI. Um, and it allows us to get quickly up and running on local environments as well. Dead letter exchanges and queues. I talked about this a bit. This is like the failed jobs in Wombat. And lastly, we use a hosted provider called Cloud AMQP. They're great. It's high availability. They have tons of RabbitMQ plugins. There's a whole ecosystem of plugins for RabbitMQ. It does a few things like web sockets and shovels I talked about. So uh, those are kind of the big points about what we did to move away from this and sort of a variety of random facts and details about how we did that. But uh, that's about it. And I just wanted to thank some of my teammates that couldn't be here today. Uh, some of you have worked with them in the past, Jason. <laughs> uh, but they've been huge, and they know a lot more about Solidus than I do. So I wanted to give them a thanks, and uh, that's it. Are there any questions? Right here. Yeah, when you start hypothesizing features, does your mind automatically go to microservices <laughs> now, or do you have to like constantly port back and forth between? Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, if you couldn't hear, uh, now that we've built some microservices, when we uh, think about new features, do we automatically think of building them as a microservice? Um, Yes, <laughs> in some cases, yes. But it's also, it, I think it has more to do with the design pattern of using a tool like RabbitMQ, where once you use a worker and queue system, you tend to see every problem in that model. Uh, and I think it's a great way of, of, of dealing with things. It's a lot like using Sidekick or, or, or something. But I think we've hit a critical mass of services for, for the time being. And I don't think that we'll be making any more for now. Uh, so, no, I guess the answer is, is for now. <laughs> Here. How do you enforce the contracts between these applications? Yeah, that's great. So that's one of the hardest things about a service-oriented architecture is how do I know when this action occurred in the storefront that someone got delivered an email over here? So when you start building many services, you tend to focus your testing on the interfaces between them. So request specs become much more important uh, if, it, if it's an if HTTP API, for example. And you focus a lot of energy on this, on global schemas that you share amongst other groups. This is what a shipment is. Um, but you're right in that. It's hard. That, that's one of the probably bigger downsides of, of going in a service-oriented direction. Here. Can you go back to your useless topology Yeah. Uh not the other one. The one you skipped. The last one. Oh uh, yeah. Oh right. So these aren't okay, so what I should say is these are all the bindings listed for a single queue. I, I misspoke in saying these are the queues. Uh, these are the routing keys for a particular queue. Um, oh, did you have a specific question? Sorry. No, I just thought it was uh, kind of interesting to see how you did it. Because we use AMQP and RabbitMQ, but it's a much narrower architecture. We didn't do fan out, so I wanted to see that. OK. I'm happy to talk about that after, too. Yeah. Uh, in the back. Uh, you said you hook into the like solid state machine to broadcast state Yeah. Do you do that for more than just ship shipping? Yeah, we do it for uh let's see. Did you run into any problems with like transitioning to the same shipping twice 
Uh, we have many, many, many queues. So we do a lot of things with RabbitMQ. So your question is, the state changes specifically in regards to Solidus that we have problems? Yes, uh, that was tremendously challenging for us. So one of the biggest problems was our support team pressing a button in Solidus admin, and then, oh, wait, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to build them yet. And then us, like, kind of, sending a message too quickly to the customer. So uh, that, that was a big challenge. And we've sort of piece, piecemeal selected each of the transitions that make sense to put our energy in and built in item potency and stuff like that. But it, that, that was a major challenge for us, yeah. Any other questions? Great. Oh, one more. Yeah, sure. So are you running your own warehouses? Uh, we have a mix, so since we have a bunch of different uh, products right now, we contract most of that out. So, you know, we manufacture and make this big large object the bed, and then the pillows and sheets, they're all manufactured at different places, and many different places in the United States, and we're now working on facilities in Europe. Uh, but we do have many different warehouses, yeah. Anybody else? Cool, okay, great.